Hey folks, let's look at the harmonic series, which is the sum of the reciprocals of the natural numbers. So we shall decide if the so-called harmonic series converges or diverges. But first, let's examine the question of why is this called the harmonic series in the first place? So take a stand-up bass, and here's the G string. And if you play the whole open G string, you'll get a tone. Now, if you place your finger lightly halfway down and play the string again, you'll get a so-called harmonic. You could place your finger one third of the way from the bridge and uh, you'll get another harmonic. And you can try it a fourth of the way from the bridge. And keep working your way down the string. So the reciprocals correspond to so-called harmonics. They're not the only harmonics on the string, but they are harmonics. And so that's really why uh, this is called the harmonic series. So you can, you can do this with any stringed instrument. So you could take the E string on a violin and hear the reciprocals. So we can actually hear the harmonic series. All right, so now let's turn to the French philosopher Nicole Oresma, who around 1350 published a proof that this series, well, I won't spoil it for you. Let's look at his argument. So we're going to write the series this way, suggestively, and we're going to look at these first two terms. And we'll notice that a third is greater than a fourth. And what that means is when you add a third and a fourth, it's greater than a fourth and a fourth, which is a half. So these two terms together add up to something that's greater than a half. Now, let's look at these next four terms. We'll notice that a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh are all bigger than an eighth. And that means when you add up these four terms, you've got to get something that's bigger than four times an eighth, which is a half. So these four terms add up to something greater than a half. How about these next eight terms. Well, a ninth, a tenth, and so on, all the way up through one fifteenth, they're all greater than one over sixteen. So that means when you add these eight terms, you have to get something that's bigger than eight times one over sixteen, which is a half. So these eight terms add up to something greater than a half. And now you see where this is headed. So the second partial sum is 1.5. The fourth partial sum is greater than two. The eighth is greater than 2.5. The sixteenth is greater than three. So if you double the number of terms you add in your partial sum, you can guarantee that you've added 0.5 to your running total. So if you're patient enough, you can find a partial sum that is arbitrarily large. And clearly, the sequence of partial sums is strictly increasing. And what this means is the limiting value, as n goes to infinity, of the sequence of partial sums has to diverge to infinity. And so Oresmo is able to prove that this sum diverges to infinity. This was sort of a highlight of medieval mathematics at the time, in some people's opinion. So let's look at a second proof. This is a more modern proof, and it actually establishes a technique which can be applied to many other types of series. So let's take the graph of the reciprocal function. What we're going to do is we're going to build boxes that have width 1 and heights that are uh, determined by putting the upper right corner on the graph. So this function value is 1, which means this first box has area 1. This function value is a half, so this box has area a half, and so on. We can just determine that these uh, this sequence of boxes have area, you know, these areas of these boxes correspond to the terms of the harmonic series. So we have this way of picturing the harmonic series. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to slide these boxes over. This will be convenient for the argument that's coming up. And the first partial sum is just one. So here's the box that represents that partial sum. And we'll notice that if we were to integrate one over x from one to two, we get a quantity that's clearly smaller from the graph. Now that quantity we can actually calculate. It's ln of two minus ln of one, fundamental theorem of calculus. ln of one is zero, so let's drop that. So we've concluded that s1 is greater than ln of two. Now by itself, that's not very exciting, but we can generalize this argument. So S2 is the sum of one and a half. It's the total area of these first two boxes, which graphically you can tell has to be greater than the integral of the reciprocal function from one to three, which is ln of three. S3 has to be greater than the integral from one to four of the reciprocal function, which is ln of four, and so on. 
And so what we conclude is that the nth partial sum has to be greater than this integral of the reciprocal function, which by the fundamental the theorem of calculus is going to give us ln of n plus 1. So this is the key inequality. Sn is greater than ln of n plus 1. Now, you could graph the sequence of partial sums and compare it to ln of n plus 1, and this isn't surprising because we just proved that Sn is greater than ln of n plus 1. But we notice that ln of n plus 1 diverges to infinity. We know that uh, it marches off uh, to arbitrarily large values, and so it, that limit is infinite, and so Sn comes along for the ride. We conclude that the limiting value of the partial sums of the harmonic series must diverge to infinity. So there is your proof, because by definition, if the limiting value of the partial sums diverges to infinity, then we say the series diverges to infinity. So the harmonic series diverges to infinity. And one last note. This is an example of a divergent series whose terms go to zero. If you look at these terms, the sequence of terms, you have one, a half, a third, a fourth, and so on. And so that limiting value is zero, and yet the series diverges to infinity. When you first learn infinite series, you might think that because the terms are getting closer and closer to zero, you should be able to add them together and get something. But what we've just proved two different ways is that that does not happen in this case. This is a, an example of a divergent series whose terms go to zero. It's a very, it is the example of such a series that you should keep in your back pocket. It might get you out of trouble when you're trying to work through some problems with infinite series later.